Well, let's look now at the psychology of Tabo Pesta, and we're going to do that with uh, Dr. Gerard Labaskahni, a criminologist and criminal psychologist, whichever uh, you choose. At some point, he spoke to Pesta. We're going to get to that, uh, Doc, in a moment. I'm sure people are quite keen to listen to exactly the kind of man that you found. Let's start with, though, the... South Africa's criminal justice system, mm. when something like this happens, it happened in May last year. Yeah. But we are being asked as members of the public just this past weekend to help in any way we can if we do spot him, go to the nearest police station. The, the picture that it paints of our criminal justice system, what do you think? Yeah, it does really make me wonder why there wasn't a bigger hoo-ha last year, May, when this kind of happened. You know, I mean, yes, I can understand if you're following up active information leads, you don't want to spook the, the guy mm. if you have information that you're following up at that time. But this is a year, this is almost a year later. You know, there should have been a massive publicity outcry at the time saying this is the person, this is the most recent photograph we have, um, etc. Um, Especially and, but it seems like now the things that are happening should have happened long ago. And that's, that's what I don't quite understand. How come it's taken so long for this to really break into the public and, and, and get the public's input on this matter? Well, let's then talk about um, the person you interviewed, mm -hmm. Tabo Besta. You spoke to him at some point. Tell us yeah. which year this was and what exactly, what kind of questions yeah. were you asking of him? Yeah, so this was, um, I think it was the 11th of October 2011. So he'd just been arrested, if I recall correctly. I was in the police as, as a profiler at the time. Yeah. And I'd be called down to interview him. He was open to being interviewed. Uh, and I had sort of, I think, about an hour and a half long interview with him. Uh, at the time, and that would have just been sort of, I guess, with the eye that if we needed to testify at sentencing, then I would have been in, in a position to give, um, you know, some good evidence. He ultimately pled guilty to the two rapes and the, and the murder that took place in Cape Town. So I guess they felt there wasn't requirement for me to come and actually give evidence in court. So my involvement was very, very brief. Hmm. Um, but, you know, obviously I, I found him to be a, a smart guy, and I wouldn't say he's a rocket scientist. But he was smart, intelligent, he's very well spoken. Yeah. And the kind of person that, you know, I think if you'd applied your knowledge and skills in a good way, he probably would have been, been quite successful. I mean, he did elaborate about him having a very rough upbringing, childhood, etc. And mm. you know, a lot of people have rough upbringings and childhoods, so that's not an excuse for going on and, and raping people. Mm. Um, and obviously, he was smart enough to, to engage in, in, in fraudulent activity. His con story was different to what we typically see of serial rapists in South Africa, which is um, you know, approaching someone on the street and offering them a job. Here, it was that, but a bit more sophisticated, yes. using Facebook, a lot more time. I think you would meet the victims in Johannesburg, for example, drive down to Durban with them. So you're spending a heck of a lot of time with them. So high risk, more complicated. But if you boil it down to its essence, it's still the offer of employment to an unsuspecting person, yes. which is what we see with the most majority of our serial rapists. This was to profile him. Mm. This was your task. Yeah. Why did he do what he did? Because you're saying that ultimately he confessed to mm. the rapes mm. and the murder. Yeah, so when I spoke to him, he, he used the word rape to describe those, those two incidences with the two ladies at the, the, at the time. He described the murder a bit differently. It was he, he described as his girlfriend, mm. um, and they had an argument at the guest house. He had a knife, and he almost describes it as if the, the murder was not intentional, there was a bit of a struggle, and she got stabbed. You know, ultimately he did plead guilty to murder, which implies there was an intent to kill. Yeah. When I interviewed him, he was kind of softening a little, a little bit, and I'm responsible for a death, but I didn't kill her or murder her, was kind of how he was phrasing it to me. But as I said, he did ultimately plead guilty to the crime of murder, which means you had the intent to kill someone, yeah. unlawful intentional killing of another person. So, I mean, you often find that the criminals will kind of try and, try and soften things uh, a little bit. And he kind of really kind of related the, the rapes, you know, blaming his his background his, uh, and his upbringing and the things that had happened to him, etc. And I can't remember all the specific details because it was 12 years ago now yeah. uh, and I don't have my file with me, etc. But his victims, the, the rape victims, Dr. Lavas um were these people, did he describe them to be his girlfriends at the mm -hmm. time or were some specifically lured so that he could just have their way with them? Yeah, so only the murder victim that he described as his girlfriend. And I, and I kind of recollect, rec recollect that he kind of met her in the same way and it kind of morphed into a bit of a relationship as opposed to him going and, and, and raping 
uh, like he did with the other two ladies. So now, the other two ladies, I think, if I recall correctly, was described as, these are my marks, I'm going to lure them, I'm going to steal their cell phones and their laptops, etc., etc., and then, of course, the rape also then took place. So mm. he described them more in the context of a victim, and as I said, if I recall correctly, the, 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 the lady in Milnerton, there was sort of a relationship, but I also think he also met her under false pretenses, if I recall correctly. And the story behind his names, there's multiple names that he goes by. So Tabo Pesta, at least some reports suggest that this is someone's actual name, but he stole this identity and that person has been reported on uh, and just how they struggled mm. to tell the authorities, I'm not this person that you think I am. Then recently he goes by another name, TK Nguana, I think. Was that ever explained during the course of your interview with him? Uh, I can't recall specifically, so I'll be hesitant to, to comment on it, but he's a con man. So, mm. you know, if Tabo Bester wasn't his real name, it wouldn't surprise me. And as you say, he, in this other business front that he was creating while from in, inside of prison, he, co of course, has to use a different name. So, you know, I think we shouldn't take anything at face value. Mm. I can't recall whether that was ultimately explored, whether his na the name Tabo Bester was genuinely his or not. Uh, I can't specifically recall. Let's talk about the money. Mm. This appears to be a person who's very well resourced. Mm. I mean, renting mansions in yeah. northern uh, leafy suburbs, that's, that's a lot of money. And mm. as one uh, newspaper report went this Sunday, one property was 40,000 rand a month and he mm. did manage to pay upfront mm. one full year of that rental. Did he ever explain where he gets the money? So back then, of course, I don't, he was not at the level of what we're seeing now. And it seems that he's done a lot better in prison than he did when he was outside of prison in terms of financial crimes. Um, so I think back then it was more luring people to steal their laptop and selling it and their phone. So that's kind of very petty kind of theft and, and robbery, etc. So he's obviously gotten worse in prison or more sophisticated. Now, he, he seems he has a financial backer. And I think, you know, the media has been speaking about who is, you know, possibly been in some relationship with him that probably helped get this going. But of course, like it's, it's, it sounds like he had a very successful business that he was running from the prison, which I'm not really surprised because every prisoner has a cell phone. We hear regularly of people running scams from prisons, whether it's straightforward phone scams to, to other more sophisticated scams, to people running cash and transit businesses from within the prison. So I'm not surprised at all. Uh, I mean, I think just about every offender has a cell phone, that's not surprising, um, to get one and to have one in prison. Unfortunately, our prisons are incredibly corrupt. If you have money, you can get whatever you want, you can get out uh, through the means like it seems he did, you can, you can get whatever you want into the prison. If you have money, it's as simple as that. And it seems unfortunate like the private prisons, <laughs> it's no different. And on that very thought of corruption mm. in our prisons, that is quite rife. I want to bring up um, the tweets that have been uh, tweeted by the leader of the Patriotic Alliance, Gaten McKenzie. This is someone who is not afraid to tell the public that he is a former prisoner, but he is rehabilitated. Listen to what he has had to say. That tweet is up on the screen. Mm. He says, and I quote now, the cover-up couldn't have happened without all three below-mentioned parties involved, politicians, prison officials and police. You need the involvement of all three. You cannot pull this off without all the parties. Let me conclude with this one. The doctor girlfriend will soon be killed together with Tabo Besta. Um, you don't pull such a brilliant escape without very powerful politicians, cops and prison officials. These officials and politicians are now hunting harder for these suspects. What do you make of that mm. statement? This is someone, yes, who's speaking speculatively, but uh, we could reasonably say mm. that he speaks with a certain level of authority. Look, I mean, prison officials involved, absolutely. I mean, there's no way he's going to get this right without warders assisting. That's for sure. Politicians, I don't know. I mean, I don't think you'd have to. I mean, lots of people are committing criminal acts from or inside the prisons. I don't think there's necessarily politicians involved, uh, unless he has info that, you know, we don't. Police, you wouldn't need. I mean, correctional services in charge of the prisons. So, 
you know, getting people to help you, you don't automatically have to have the police. Maybe in the cover-up afterwards, mm. did they go that far to try and influence the investigating officers of this case? That, of course, could be a possibility and maybe as information. But the primary people you're going to have to bribe would be the, correct, the, the prison warders themselves to let you go out to get a body in, because it's very unlikely that they killed another prisoner, because then you would notice that there's, not a, there's a prisoner somewhere not here, yeah. uh, who they might have had to say, well, he maybe has escaped, and then they're using that body to replace Tobel Bester's. So it's, it's probably a body that was brought in from somewhere. Um, and I said, but you'd have to be bribing a number of people to allow that, for that process to take place. Yeah. I think what's striking about what Gaten McKenzie is saying there for me is that the authorities now are probably hunting more for Mr. Bester and his girlfriend, if indeed that's who he is with. They're hunting for them harder now than they ever have before, given that this escape was in May. But more importantly, he says that these people could be killed in order to cover all of this up. I think it would depend for me on how, how much on an organized crime type of level. If you're just bribing warders, would they then try and hunt you down to kill you? Uh, I don't know. If this was more of a bigger picture like he, like Mr. McKenzie is implying, yes, I think that the, the more you have higher up people and the more perhaps on an organized crime level, they might want to now cover this up. But that would depend... Contract killings in if, South Africa yeah, are quite... But that would depend, I think, if we're dealing with that level of people. But if this yeah. is, you know, me bribing four or five warders to get the body in and me out, I don't know if that's such on an organized level they're going to not try and hunt down Tawu Vesta. Mm. But if it's an organized, more on the organized level and a more senior involvement level, th there's a possibility that those individuals are going to definitely want to try and cover up their tracks. How deep in trouble is the alleged girlfriend, this Dr. Nandipa Makutunwan? Now, the understanding is that she may have even gone to court in order to say things there that potentially could be false. How deep in trouble could she be? Yeah, look, I mean, if she has facilitated the escape of a prisoner, uh, and if she was facilitating his ability to commit, you know, fraud from inside the prison, um, that's potential. that's definitely jail time you're facing. If she, you know, if the money she was, if, 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 she paid money to have someone murdered, they can smuggle a body in, they could leak, then they could be, she could be charged with murder. So it really depends on how involved, and how involved they can prove, of course, she was, which would lead to the potential charges. So again, so if they can prove that she facilitated the, someone to be murdered, mm. that could be the body to replace them, you can charge her with murder as being the financier, if mm. that's what she was doing. But for any of the other stuff, it's sort of what you call aiding and abetting, which you know, might have anything from a couple of years jail time, etc. But I, so I would suppose the worst scenario here would be that she, if she can be proved to be fac having facilitated the death of someone to be the exchange body for Tobo Bester to escape, then that would probably be the most serious charge she could face. Final question, Dr. Labas Khakni, and this goes to the heart of why someone so dangerous would be or belongs in prison. <laughs> the escape was in May. Mm. The authorities are now <laughs> under the glare of the media. They are now making real efforts to try and have him re-arrested. This is a convicted murderer and rapist. Serial rapist, yeah. How negligent have our authorities been for not disclosing this soonest it happened? Yeah, look, so I mean, he falls in the category of a serial rapist because we have at least two convicted in the, uh, cases where he's convicted of rape, separate cases. And, you know, there were others where people just didn't want to go to the extent of having to go to court to testify. So definitely two convictions of separate rapes qualifies him as a serial rapist. We then have a murder. And what we often see in, 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 in serial murder cases, they start off with rapes and then go into murder. So we have definitely a serial rapist, a potential serial murderer. You should have been, as I said, warning the public earlier about this individual to get their help in identifying where he could be for, and to make sure people can pr protect themselves hmm. if they're approached by this individual. Um, should have taken place last year. And like I said, I can understand if on the early phases of his escape, they're following up leads yeah. that you don't want to go public and let him know that you're after him. Because the minute you put that out there, he knows you're after him. His ruse has not worked. So from an investigation point of, point, point of view, there might be reasons why you want to keep it quiet. But not for almost a year. Because what is he doing in that year? Potentially raping people, because that's what he's done in the past potentially murdering people, because that's what he's done in the past, mm. committing fraud and other crimes, you know, that's almost also a guarantee. So very, very dangerous position that South African prison authorities 
yeah. have placed South Africans. Yeah, I think if you had a victim who turned out to be raped after he left, she would have a huge civil suit against correctional services. A huge one. Wow. Dr. Gerard Labaskafni, let me thank you very much for your time. A criminologist, someone who has interviewed Tabo Besta. Well, at least that's the official name he goes by.